Uh, today we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit because it's Pentecost Sunday. It's, uh, Pentecost Sunday is one of the, the days in the church calendar, the big C church calendar, not like, you know, booking a scheduling thing here at Carl Road Baptist, but for millennia, the, the church, uh, or at least centuries, the, the big C church has had this ry- rhythm of the year where the, the shape of the year is shaped by the gospel, beginning in Advent and Epiphany into Lent and Holy Week, and then 50 days after Easter Sunday comes Pentecost Sunday. Uh, it's a it's a time where we reflect on, as I was chewing on it this week, it's this really interesting thing about Jesus and the Great Commission. I feel like Baptists, we love the Great Commission, you know, go, we love missionaries, all that stuff. Uh, but there's this interesting thing that I think we miss sometimes. Because uh, Jesus, he, he rises from the dead, spends some time with the disciples, teaching them, he commissions them. Uh, but then he says this in Luke 24, And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from on high. This is kind of an amazing statement because Jesus, with this great commission to go and make disciples and all that stuff we love to talk about, he's like, go and do that, but wait and stay until the Holy Spirit comes. He's pumped to send his apprentices out into the world as the risen king, but there's a but. Wait and stay for power from on high. And if you're familiar with the Bible, that's what happened at the Pentecost Festival, which happens 50 days after Passover, which is the day that Jesus died, the time Jesus died. And all of the disciples are in the upper room, and this is what happens when the day of Pentecost came. They were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. The promised Holy Spirit comes, fills Jesus' people with the very presence of God, and the church was born. The Great Commission commenced, and the world has never been the same. The plan all along, uh, I'm not the best planner, but the plan all along in this sermon series was to get to Pentecost Sunday here in chapter 5 of Galatians where we start turning from all this theological discussion of justification to uh, the, the talk of what it means to walk in step with the Spirit. This series through Galatians framed around the idea of life with God uh, in, in a very real sense, and I think undervalued sense, culminates with the Holy Spirit. For four chapters, Paul has been riled up and agitated and making all kinds of arguments and intense statements to the Galatian churches about what the basis for our life with God really is. Are we we justified? Are we made right with God? Do we get life with God and become part of his family because we do stuff, because we follow the Jewish law? Do we we need Jesus and we need to be circumcised and to eat kosher? Do we need some type of external behavior or mark on our bodies or a fancy hat or or whatever you you could come up with to earn our good standing with God? And for four chapters, Paul has been saying in many different ways, very passionately, no. Jesus and him crucified and risen from the dead is the only basis for our right standing with God. To the point where he said last week, we said what we saw last week. He didn't say it last week. It was a little bit before last week. We talked about it last week. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you, if you let yourself be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. If we take a little Jesus, add circumcision. Take a little Jesus, add voting a certain way, or add not drinking, cussing, or chewing, or going around with girls who do. Uh, whatever it is you add to Jesus to, in order to earn your right standing before God, uh, then you are falling away from grace. You're rejecting G- the, the message that Jesus shared because our life with God is based on grace. It's an invitation we receive. It's a promised gift that goes all the way back to Abraham in the Old Testament as we've talked about several times in this journey in Galatians. And so if that's how we get life with God, this just, are we're justified, we're brought into this relationship through Jesus' life, death, and re- resurrection, then what we see Paul shifting to begin talking about is that the way we experience life with God uh, is through the Holy Spirit. 
The way we experience uh, the life that we receive by grace, the life uh, that Jesus died for us to experience is through the Holy Spirit. The main idea for us is this. We experience life with God through the Holy Spirit who makes us people of love. Life with God is such good news. It's the best news. Whether you know it or not, it's what your heart is longing for and was designed to be satisfied by. It's the reality that Jesus died for you to experience. And the Holy Spirit is the primary way that we experience life with God as Jesus followers. Anything apart from the Holy Spirit could be good, could be helpful, could help in some sense, uh, but without the Holy Spirit working in it, even Scripture. Do you know there's people who know and study the Bible for a living who don't believe, <laughs> don't believe it? Like there are non-Christian biblical scholars in academia. It's a weird experience in seminary to run across those people. Uh, like the, the Bible is a beautiful gift, but it is, uh, it is empowered by the breath of God to have any impact to make us people of love and experience God's presence. And the, the language in this passage is so intimate. It, it talks about be, walk by the Spirit, be led by the Spirit, live by the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit. Do you see the, the in, attentiveness? If you, you know, it's like if, if Johnny is trying to like follow in my footsteps in the snow, you know, he's like dialed in, like carefully trying to land in the next footstep. There's interaction in these phrases. There's a relationship in how we are meant to live with God through the Spirit. Life with God through the Holy Spirit is a huge topic, and in my experience, it's one that I think a lot of church traditions uh, kind of neglect, because uh, we, 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 it's, it's a little bit mystical, so it's not quite cut and dry, you know, as, as some things that we might like. Uh, it's not something you can rush. It's something that you kind of have to submit to. You don't have control over this life with God in the Spirit. So I'm, I'm super pumped to be talking about talk about it. We're going to slow down in our journey through Galatians uh, and, and for the next few weeks be in this passage here uh, today. Um, we uh, and I, I, I get really practical with it. I want to unpack uh, who, the, who the Holy Spirit is, uh, what, what's going on with the flesh, what stops us from living the Spirit, all kinds of things. So it's going to be fun. And I just want to encourage you, we'll get to this at the end, I would encourage you to, to kind of camp out in this passage. It's uh, Galatians 5, 13 through 26. I encourage you to, to read it regularly, maybe even memorize it. Um, and we're going we're gonna to take some time really unpacking all that God has for it. And, and I'm, when it comes to the spiritual life, uh, maybe to a fault, I'm like a gnarly practical guy. Like, don't give me empty spiritual phrases that just kind of like are nice or look good on a coffee cup. Like, I want to know what does this mean for real life. And as I've studied the Bible and as God has taught me, like, understanding the Holy Spirit and how we practically live with him, understanding the flesh and what the sin nature is and, and how we address that in real life brings unbelievable fruit. If you've felt stuck in your spiritual walk, then stick around because there's some power from on high available to you. Uh, if you have felt powerless, kind of weak, anemic in your spiritual life, just kind of stumbling along, slumping along, then stick around because there's just clear pathway forward to experience the life with God in the spirit uh, that Jesus died for us to, to have. So here we go. Let's talk about the Holy Spirit. Before we talk about it, I just want to say that there are probably a few of us in the room that have some kind of baggage around Holy Spirit stuff. They're just like the Bible has been misused and hurt people to hurt people. Holy Spirit uh, has been used to manipulate and and hurt people. Uh, We've talked about this before. Do you know what the 11th commandment is in church? Thou shalt not do anything that you see someone else doing poorly. <laughs> you know, so we see like, oh, well, I was in a church where they said this and this about the Holy Spirit, and it really hurt me, and it's not biblical, and so I'm just going to throw out the Holy Spirit, throw out the baby with the bath water. Um, if that's you, I'm sorry that that's been your experience, that you've been hurt by something as beautiful as the, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and my invitation to you today is to, to let the Bible 
define how we understand and relate to the Holy Spirit instead of our experiences or our fear of it going too far. You know, the Holy Spirit, like we do the spirit with the seatbelt or whatever, where we're worried of it getting too far. Uh, but, we, but God is a God of order, and the Holy Spirit is God, and so we can come to, uh, to God, the Holy Spirit, uh, and trust that he knows what he's doing uh, and that he uh, is good and will draw us into life with God. Calling this part of the sermon, have you met the Holy Spirit? A little bit of an overview. The Holy Spirit is God. He's a member of the Trinity, co-equal with God the Father and God the Son. He's not like a second-tier God or anything like that. He's a vital player in God's plan of redemption. Without the Holy Spirit, there is, the plan of redemption doesn't work. Like It's part of God's design to save us, to sanctify us, to make us people of love. A three-word understanding uh, to help us understand the Holy, who the Holy Spirit is. This is from scholar, uh, Bible scholar Gordon Fee. God's empowering presence. The Holy Spirit is God's empowering presence. The degree to which we relate to the Holy Spirit is the same degree to which we experience God's empowering presence. The Holy Spirit is the way that we interact with God on this side of Jesus' return. Yes, it's Scripture. This is not negating or lowering Scripture by any means, but at that time when you opened Scripture and you read some and it spoke to you and you felt loved by God, that was the Holy Spirit using God's Word uh, to land in our hearts. Anything that we've experienced that shows us God's love, where we've had a spiritual moment, that was the Holy Spirit at work. Now, looking at the biblical story, where's the first time that God's empowering presence shows up? We'll look at Genesis chapter 1. The Holy Spirit was there in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Holy Spirit isn't an afterthought, but he was there in the very beginning, at the beginning of creation, hovering, prepared uh, to be a part of the creation process. Let us make man in our image. And all throughout the Old Testament, you see various people being filled with the Holy Spirit in various ways for various purposes. The prophets are filled with Holy Spirit's, with the Holy Spirit's power. But one thing, this is some Bible trivia for you, we'll talk more about on Labor Day when we talk about vocation. The first time in Scripture where it talks about someone being filled with the Holy Spirit uh, was uh, Bezalel in Ezra 35, uh, when they're, uh, they're sorry, Ezra 3, when they're building uh, the temple. And Bezalel was a workman, he was a stonemason. Uh, and it talked about him being filled with the Holy Spirit, not to preach a sermon or to prophesy or to heal someone, uh, but to, to build God's temple with skill and wisdom. Beautiful glimpse of how God works in our life. The Holy Spirit is not just for spiritual stuff, but it gets into all of our lives, even how we build, build church buildings. Now, for most of the Old Testament, that temple that Bezalel helped make uh, was the place where God's empowering presence dwelt. Uh, It began in the tabernacle with Moses, and then when the temple was built, there was a holy of holies in the center of it where God's empowering presence dwelt on the earth. It was an actual spot on the earth where God's presence dwelt. But because of sin, humans were not in right standing with God, not yet justified. There was very limited access to God's empowering presence. There was a big, huge, thick curtain that cut off God's powering presence. And only one man, one day of the year, could go into the Holy of Holies to offer a sacrifice for sin, a spotless lamb. And so all during the the centuries where this is the case, where God's people are cut off from God's presence, there's this promise. Several places, but Joel 2 might be the clearest one, where God promises this. I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. This is a staggering promise. 
In the, in the Old Testament, it was very special circumstances where the Spirit landed on someone. And in common time, most people were cut off uh, from the Holy of Holies in God's presence. But here is this promise that God's Spirit would be poured out, not into a building. It's not like they would franchise the Holy of Holies and have you know, conveniently placed you know, Holy of Holies all over like Starbucks. No, it, w- it would be poured out into people. And this is what we read about happening at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Tongues of fire resting on everyone. And Peter stands up and gives the first, uh, the first sermon of the era of the church and actually quotes Joel 2 saying, this is it. Joel 2 just happened. Do you hear the sermons? Do you hear the, the people speaking of tongues? This is the Spirit's in breaking out of the, or outbreaking out of the temple into the lives of real people. So where is God's temple on the earth? Where does God's empowering presence dwell on the earth today? Look at 1 Corinthians 6.19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? The sad thing is some of us might be scared or uneasy of the Holy Spirit, even as he's in your body. Even as God's empowering presence is there in your body. This is a staggering a glimpse into God's design for salvation, for the Christian life, and for his mission in the world. It was to take his empowering presence out of this cloistered holy of holies and to put it into you. As you go about your days, as you love your families, as you go to work, as you talk to your neighbors... And something that I think is often missed when people study Galatians is that the Holy Spirit is the goal of the first four chapters. Look at how Paul summarizes this in Galatians 3. He says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that what? By faith, we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Jesus died for your sins to forgive you, to adopt you into God's family so that you could receive God's empowering presence. You could live in step with God's empowering presence. The Spirit is a gift, a treasure, the presence of the Almighty God. The the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is a gift given to you and I through Jesus, so that we can have power from on high and live life with God in God's empowering presence. We don't have to make a spiritual pilgrimage to a temple to be near God. You don't have to like come to you know, a holy person or like a spiritual leader to be near God. That God's presence dwells with us in the Holy Spirit through Jesus. Behold the teaching of the Bible, Christian. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you have been filled with the Holy Spirit, the very Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. For people who try to follow Jesus or live the Christian life without interaction with the Holy Spirit, it's like driving around in a Lamborghini but keeping it only in first gear. You know, just like, you know, just like, there's no power. You're sitting on all this horsepower and it's just, tedious and jumpy and not very much fun, frankly, kind of boring. That's why many of us feel stuck in our spiritual journey. We've reduced Christianity just to, to something in our head. If I just knew more, then I, then I, would, I would be better Christian or I'd, I'd experience more of life with God. Well, that's part of it. Or we reduce Christianity to just a church activity. If I do enough, if I'm busy then I'm okay. That's what the Christian life is. Or if, if it's how I feel, if my feelings reflect the way I think I should feel, then, then I'm doing okay. And so I'm going to find a church with the right band, with the right kind of sermons, with the fog machines, with the organ, what, you know, whatever it does to make, make your spiritual you know, meter uh, Twitter, then, then that's what it is. There's lots of different ways we can try to do life with God apart from the Spirit. 
And God help us, I think the church in, the, in America is, is super guilty of this. We lean on all kinds of other things other than just God's presence in the gathered, uh, gathering of the saints to try to make something happen spiritually. And the strongest desire of my heart for us as a church family, something that I would pick over a million dollars or a hundred new families joining our church is that we lean more and more into life with God and the power of the Spirit. For me, getting to know the Holy Spirit is a relatively new journey uh, that, that I've been on for maybe five years or so, and it's been so fun. But it's been hard. It's been hard and confusing at times. Uh, and it's been the way that I've felt most loved by God. For me, the, the first shot across the bow in the Holy Spirit was, has been in silence. I've been getting introduced to contemplative disciplines and silence and solitude where I, I create space for, for God's spirit to speak to me. And there was a, a, a time of silence I was on uh, in, a, in, a, in a monastery up in, I think, Cary, Ohio, somewhere north, and they, they had the Stations of the Cross, and it was like walking around there in silence, looking at the Stations of the Cross, <clears throat> that I, I felt Jesus' words so clearly to me. He was, he was like, I was, I was so stressed and you know, monkey mind about all this things that I, all this stuff that was on my plate. And he was just like, where were you when I was going through this stage of the cross? Where were you when I was doing this on your behalf? I was like, oh yeah, I wasn't even around. I was doing zero things and Jesus was already at work. It was this beautiful moment of feeling God's presence. And then I've experienced, and this is the beautiful thing about the Holy Spirit. He meets us in silence. He meets us personally as we're reading scripture. Uh, and then the, the flip side is in community with other spirit-filled Jesus followers. I was at a leader's cohort in San Francisco uh, doing some training years ago. I was brand new. This, this is like super brand new to some of the Holy Spirit stuff. And it was, about, it was a, way, a way, a style of doing church. So I was there to get all strategic and think all like, hey, how are we going to do church in a way that really forms people? Uh, and the first day, he's like, all right, we're just going to have some... Uh, I forget what they called it, ministry time, I think is what they called it, just unstructured time, like an hour and a half, two hours for like the 10 or 10 or 12 of us in a room where you could sing a song, you could pray, you could share a scripture. And uh, I, you know, I, I like structure and all this stuff. I was like, what is happening? Uh, but as we did that morning after morning, it began, became such a sweet space. And particularly at a point where I prayed out loud a, a confession I confessed uh, sorrow at how unloving I, I, I saw parts of my heart being. And in that space with the Holy Spirit present in the room, people didn't, you know, oh, that was awkward and changed the subject. The whole group moved towards me and laid hands on me and started praying over me, prophesying over me, speaking God's blessing over my life. It was just the time I felt most seen and loved by God speaking things that I, I hadn't prayed, that I hadn't shared, that they, that, they, that they somehow knew. I felt like God was saying, I see you, I love you, I'm making you more into a person of love. It's a beautiful way, when, when, a beautiful thing when God's people, filled with the Spirit, look at each other with the eyes of the Spirit in love. Love is the first and most important function of the Spirit. It is through the Spirit that we receive and experience God's love, and in experiencing God's love and the power of the Spirit, that we're transformed into people of love. I, don't, I feel like I heard a lot growing up where it's just like, I need to be more loving, I need to be more loving, I need to be more loving. And that's just not the message of Scripture. I mean, we're called to love one another, uh, but we're called to be loved first. We're, we're called to love one another, but not to muster that up in our own strength, but instead to, like a branch and a vine, be conduits for the fruit of the Spirit, uh, the first of which is love. The connection between love and the Holy Spirit is so profound. Like the, the famous love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, that we, we like to read uh, kind of out of context at weddings. No offense if you read that at your wedding. <laughs> you know, the love is patient, love is kindness, uh, love is kind. That happens in the middle of the most thorough teaching about how the supernatural power of the Spirit happens in a church gathering. 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 are all about the spiritual gifts that make us all uncomfortable. And right in the middle, it's like, the way of love. And it ends in chapter 14, verse 1, where it says, Therefore, pursue the way of love and eagerly desire the spiritual gifts. 
In order to pursue the way of love, we are called to desire the spiritual gifts. Because the Spirit of God, who is love, fills us with love for one another, with power that's not our own. And that finally brings us to our text today. Look at verse 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. Verse 16, so I say, walk by the Spirit. So this whole conclusion of the first four chapters, four and a half chapters, is therefore love one another. And so how do you do that? Walk by the Spirit. Life with God is the point. We get life with God through the Spirit who makes us people of love. Life with God is the point that you and I were created for. We get that through the Holy Spirit. God draws near to us, dwells in our bodies. And it's through intimacy with God we begin to imitate our Father, imitate God our Father, and become people of love. Paul says, love your neighbor as yourself, therefore do all this stuff. No, he says, walk by the Spirit. Be in communion with the God of love. Set your life up to experience God's presence. That's what it means to walk. Set, set your life up, your steps throughout your day to walk in God's presence and experience his love. Paul says it bluntly, uh, this connection bluntly in Romans 5.5. 5. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. It's our connection to the Holy Spirit by, by which we receive. Our lives become like empty vessels that we can receive God's love being poured into us. These love-thirsty hearts being satisfied by the Spirit coming into us. In order to truly love other people, love is something that we need to experience from God in our hearts. Not just as a fact in our mind, but we, we love God, we love others because he first loved us. You see this in kids and our adventures in foster care. It's like kids that did not grow up receiving love in their family of origin struggle to love. Love is something that we catch, something that we're formed by in relationship with others. And that's the good news of the gospel. Maybe your family wasn't super loving and nurturing and you didn't learn how to be loving. God can show you that, can change you through the Holy Spirit. Because when we try to love others on our own, things go, go sideways. We're trying to love others in our own strength. We, we inevitably begin to use people to try to get things from them. Have you ever experienced someone who's like trying to be loving, trying to like do a bunch of stuff for you, but it just comes across like frazzled and anxious and kind of makes you nervous? Like, maybe that's just me, but it's like coming from this stressed place where they're, they're, they have a sense of pressure and that, like, they want something from you, you know, or, or maybe you've experienced that. Like, you, somebody did something nice and you say thank you, and then they come at you with, with like, lots of, like, inten intense emotions. Like, they, they had some transaction in their mind that they didn't tell you about how you were supposed to respond to what they're doing. You didn't praise them or affirm them enough. Sometimes... When we feel unlovable, we will try in our own strength to be loving enough to earn people's loves. And that's, that's slavery. That's performing for love, which will never work. It is in receiving God's love that he's poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that we begin to be free to love others. And so the question for us is, do we want more of God's empowering presence if you like how your life is, if you don't want things to change, uh, then you can tune this part out. You know? But if you want more of life with God, then getting to know the Holy Spirit practically is a journey to take. We're going to talk much more about this over the next few weeks, but for today, two things. Uh, the first is to take 10 minutes a day to prayerfully meditate on this passage, particularly Galatians 16, 13 through 25, sorry, six, 13 through 25. Begin with some silence and pray, Holy Spirit, fill me. Speak to me. And then read it through a few times. Maybe read it out loud 
and, and just be silent in between those readings and, and see what, what the Holy Spirit brings to mind. Because we'll talk, we'll talk more about this, but you see in this passage that there's, there's these two lists. There's the, the, the works of the sin nature, the works of the flesh, and then there's the fruit of the Spirit. And understanding both of these categories is crucial for walking in step with the Spirit. So we need the Holy Spirit to point out ways where we're operating in the flesh, ways where we're operating in the sin nature. And then we need the Holy Spirit to, to invite us into the fruit of the Spirit, to meet those things with God's love and transform them into the fruit of the Spirit. And so as you read this, it gives it spin, you're quiet, it gives space through the Holy Spirit in the Scriptures to maybe show you know, that there's some discord or jealousy or fits of rage, selfish ambition that comes to mind. And because we're covered in grace, because we're made right with God, justified by grace alone, you can just repent of that. You can turn from that. And then turn to the Spirit, turn to God, and receive peace and kindness and forgiveness for other people who've hurt you. If we want the life Jesus died for us, if we want more freedom, then we must draw near and give him space, give him access to our lives, our emotions, our bodies, our minds, and meditating on scripture, particularly one like this that's so practical that has these two lists and, and, and invites you to just sit with it and listen. It could be powerful. The second thing is to come forward for prayer. I'm kind of building on what God did in Sheila. Like when God does something, you know, in a church family, it's like, hey, maybe he wants to do more of that. And so I just want to invite you to come forward for prayer after the gathering. We invite you forward for prayer after every gathering, so this is kind of the same thing we always do. Uh, but there'll be myself and a few others up front uh, after you're dismissed to come forward, particularly for healing. It could be emotional inner healing or it could be physical healing, some pain, uh, that you've been living with. We'd love to, to lay hands on you uh, and pray. Not that we're like super special, you know, super Christians or anything like that. Just people filled with the Spirit who love to pray for people. So I invite you to come forward and, and take a risk. I realize it can, can be risky. But what if God wants to meet you the way he met Sheila? Well, he wants to show you his love in a real tangible way in your body, uh, the way he, he met Sheila in relieving her of pain and answering her prayer to show, show her his love. So you got a couple songs to noodle on that, but I invite you to come forward for prayer uh, at the end of the gathering. The thing that's exciting about the Holy Spirit stuff beyond healing, renewal, life with God for us personally is that when a group of people filled with the Holy Spirit come together to join God on mission, the world is never the same. It's so exciting to see what God could do in us and through us as we lean in together to life with God and the Holy Spirit. What God wants to do in Northland, what things he wants to renew, what evil he wants to turn back as we, filled with the Holy Spirit, go into dark places around our city with the light of Jesus. Let me pray. Oh, Father, thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you that you loved us so much that you didn't want to just save us and put us on a shelf, but you wanted to come live with us and your spirit in our bodies. Thank you, Father, for this incredible news that you don't exist in a holy of holies somewhere far away, but you're right here with us. Holy Spirit, would you come? We welcome you. We want you to have your way with us. We want you to adjust our agenda our plans if you want to do something. We want you uh, to, to lead us. We want to be led by you as a church family. So please come. In Jesus' name, amen.